Hello everyone and welcome to this video series about few shot learning. So in this first video I'm going to introduce few shot learning, I'm going to define the problem, also to describe the terminology used in few shot learning. At the end of this course I hope that you will have a good overview on what few shot learning is. You will be probably able to understand the most important algorithms and approaches used in few shot learning. So let's start with something quite obvious, but as the name suggests, few shot learning is dealing with the particular case of a low data. Right, we have a low amount of data, and we want to learn from this low amount of data. We want to be very good uh, at generalizing on this low amount of data. Something that's also pretty interesting is that there are some connection between human learning and few shot learning. Think about that, if you see a child learning a new word, the child doesn't need to listen to this word thousands of millions of times, just need to listen to this word once to remember it pretty well, to generalize to people pronouncing this word in different ways, right? And uh, we, as adults, we also do the same thing when we see a new object, we just need to see this object once or twice to memorize this, this object, we don't need to see it thousands of millions of times. Like in supervised learning where you basically need a huge data set of literally millions of samples, like an ImageNet, to, to learn and to perform pretty well. So our learning, uh, the way we learn is pretty different from a supervised learning approach. It's more similar to a few short learning setting. Very interesting thing is that few short learning is quite similar to different other approaches like online learning or continual learning. or even uh, incremental learning, yeah. And, you know, these two sometimes are, these are very similar, you know, there is not really a difference between the two. Online learning is generally a bit different between them because in online learning you have a stream of data where you have one sample uh, per time step. And in online learning you basically having a few short learning setup because you're basically having receiving a streaming of data and even if you have a very small mini batch at each time step this uh, mini batch can be different from the previous one and different from all the others that you see before it's like when you have a robot that is exploring a new environment this robot can go in different rooms and the objects that are in one room they may not be in another room right so you have to learn remember that specific object from a very low amount of data so there, is, there are some similarities between all these approaches and few shot learning. Okay, we'd like now to give a look to an example that is uh, reported in this uh, very good article. I suggest you to, give, to read it, it's very good. And these guys are um, cognitive scientists, most of them, and they want to very interested in matching cognitive science and machine learning. This example is pretty interesting because you have these uh, imaginary objects some of these objects, three of them belonging to the same group, are highlighted in red. And in this imaginary world, these are called tufas. So this is a sort of alien world, this is an alien language. So we are tufas. Having these three examples, we want to know which one of the remaining objects is a tufas. So I'm going to do it now. You can try as well. And I don't remember probably all of them, I will try. You can also stop the video and try to understand which one of them is belonging to the same class. So let's start with the first one. The first one is pretty similar, so I would say yes, this is a tufas. No, no, no. Uh, this one is also pretty similar, as you can see, so I would say yes. This one very similar. Then this no, no, this one yes. No, 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 no. Let's see, this one is a bit borderline, but I would say yes, it's a tufas, I think. Also this one, probably, yes. Okay, now we'll change slide and we will see if I if I got them. That was pretty good, as you can see. I find all of them. And probably also, you did also a good job, I think. So for us, it's pretty natural and easy to remember these objects. 
And, you know, I think this is also has some evolutionary meaning. Probably we have to be very good in recognizing dangerous animals or dangerous plants just after uh, having seen them once or twice, right? Because this is, is, is literally a matter of life for us. So this can have a strong evolutionary uh, justification, this ability that we have. Let's try to give a more formal definition. So generally, we still have a huge data set of images and classes. <coughs> And then we have different tasks. We'll see now what is a task. This is task one, task two here. Basically, each task is made by a support set and a query set. And in the support set, we have three different classes, three different objects, and just one example per class. So we have one dog, one plane, one tree. And the query set is a sort of validation set. Sometimes it's also called a target set. And basically the idea is that from this small amount of data, you have to perform pretty well on this bit larger amount of data, unlabeled data. So in this case, we have to associate this dog to class one, this image to class one as well, and so on for the others. When we sample another task, task two in this case, we may have different support and query. In this case, we have three different classes, as you can see. So also the objects are changing in this case. But more formally, a task I is sampled from a probability distribution over tasks, right? And each task I is just a set given by support and a query set, right? So we have a support and a query. So our support and our query, they can change. So let's, let's try to build an imaginary task tree so you can better understand what's going on. So we still have three classes, right? The number of classes is identified as number of way and in this case, we are in a three-way setup. And the number of shots identifies the number of samples per class. In this case, we have just one sample per class, so we are in the one-shot setting. It's probably the most difficult. So if we want to buy to create now a task three, we still have three-way, one shot, so we have to pick three different classes from the data sets. Let's say that we pick, uh, I don't know, kind of a bird, we have a truck, and for class 3, we actually can pick something that was before in one of the two tasks, it can be a cat. What does it mean? Well, it means that we are literally sampling an image from a different class, but this class can be also been picked before in a different task. The difference is that now the cat that was before class two, now it's class three. So this makes impossible to use the standard supervised learning approaches. Because in supervised learning, you suppose that there is the, a fixed association between a specific uh, object target and the corresponding label, right? So uh, the class associated to a cat remains the same. Okay, there is no a different label associated to the same name. You can see some terminology now about future learning. We saw that the number of way identifies the number of classes. So if we say J way means literally J classes. Number of shot identifies the number of samples per classes. So K shot means that there are K samples for that class. One shot means one sample per class. The sample set is just given by J times K, right? In our case it was three because we had uh, three-way one shot. Query set, sometimes called target set, has a different number of samples. This doesn't really matter, but has been just formalized lately in some of the papers. But before it was not pretty. It's not very clear what should be the number of samples in the query set. 
but this can actually have some impact in, on learning because if, if this is huge. Uh, this can have an impact on learning, and we'll see why. And the task is just given by support and query, right? Now, what's happening at training and test time is that we are picking a random task, then at test time we have unseen task. This, these are of, often given by novel classes, never saw training time. And this is something crucial to understand. So, if we separate between test and train, and we also separate between uh, support and query set, and here we are caring about if there are labels or not, okay? So at training time, both the support and the query, they have labels. So there are associated labels. While at test time, only the support set has labels. The query set doesn't have labels. This is important because since at training time, both support and query have uh, associated labels, it means that we can basically stitch together S and Q. So we can join these two sets. And what it gives us is a sort of standard mini batch. The same mini batch that is used in, in uh, supervised learning. So if we join support and query set at any time, this gives us a sort of mini batch. And this opened the door to transfer learning approaches, where basically you are applying the same ideas of supervised training, just retraining the very last layer to accommodate for this uh, changing in, in, in the associated classes that we saw in the slides before, since one class can be number one in one task and number two in another task. We have just to change the very last layer. We'll see how to do it. But I think that's it for this first video. We'll see in the second video how uh, we can create some basic algorithms very easily, which are the, the most common datasets. And I hope you enjoyed.